this episode, this UFC preview, we have Action Network senior writer, Sean Zarillo, and Action Network MMA analyst, former MMA fighter, Billy Ward, your host, Brendan Glasheen. So we head to O2 Arena in London, Blades Aspinall. Blades is uh, the slight dog at plus 125, Aspinall at minus 145, the latest coming on DraftKings. Heavyweight uh, main event, Sean Zarillo. Blades has won six of his last seven fights, coming in as a dog. How are you betting this fight, and uh, what do you make of it? Will be an underdog for the first time in his career, or at least his UFC career as well, because he typically has the wrestling advantage over the heavyweights, and that's not something that you see in this division as much. But Tom Aspinall is a great grappler. His dad was a decorated Brazilian jiu-jitsu grappler. His grappling has looked tremendous whenever he's used it at the UFC level. The question with Aspinall was and will continue to remain his cardio because he has finished his opponents too quickly, and you can't really hold that against them. It shows his upside, shows how quickly he's able to get people out of there, and he is a finisher. But if this guy gets extended, we still don't know what he's going to look like in rounds three and four. He may gas out completely because he's made it to the second round in the past and been huffing and puffing. He's very athletic. I'd say he's the better athlete in this matchup. Maybe the better pure grappler, even though Blades has the better wrestling and is the much better wrestler overall. But Aspinall, very athletic. I think he's the better striker, and his speed is going to pro- pose a problem for Blades, particularly early. So if I'm looking at this fight from a pre-fight betting perspective, now that Blades' money line is getting closer to that plus 125, plus 130 mark, I'm going to consider betting him. I'd prefer to wait until live after round one because Aspinall typically finishes his opponents early. He should be the better striker early when he's fresh. But once he starts the tire, Blades should be able to wrestle him and take over down the stretch. Blades has the proven cardio. He's been 25 minutes multiple times in the past. His durability is a bit of a question mark. So I'm not sure how he's going to look if Aspinall connects clean early. So what I'm going to look to do, live bet Blades after round one play the fight to end inside the distance at a big juicy number around minus 280. You can parlay that up with some other things I like on this card, like Mark Casey's money line. So parlay that fight to end inside the distance number at a juicy price, because I think either Aspinall finishes Blades early or Blades wrestles Aspinall and grinds him out on the mat late. He has pretty good ground and pound, and Aspinall has a good submission game as well. So I see this fight finishing inside the 25 minutes. I see Aspinall being dangerous early and Blades eventually taking over down the stretch. But as I said, now that that money line on the Blades side is coming up closer to plus 125, plus 130, I'm starting to get a bit more interested in the underdog. Blades gets the juices going with that Mortal Kombat intro. So as Zarillo said, maybe uh, maybe you wait after round one and see how you evaluate. Billy, how are you looking at uh, Blades here? I I think you've got a similar sentiment as uh, Zarillo. Yeah, you know, I've I've been watching this one pretty close all week. We saw a lot of heavy favorites, mostly on the British side, to open the week. And most of them have increased a little bit. And I I kind of set for myself mentally a little bit earlier that I wanted plus 130 or better on Blade. So we're getting there, as Sean pointed out. The best I'm seeing right now on him is plus 125. It's just not quite enough for me. I think my lean is that he'll be able to get some takedowns. And he'll probably be able to avoid the submissions on the ground. But we'll be able to do it enough times to avoid the striking of Espinal. That's my real question. So, yeah, you know, when it was plus 110 earlier in the week, I had no interest in this one. And I'm going to hold out for plus 130. And if that doesn't ever come up, then I'm with Sean. I'm going to look at some live angles there. But as it stands right now, no bet for me until we can get just a little bit more on the blade side. Okay, fight of the night coming up. Also favorite props. We'll have a DFS breakdown from Billy for UFC London and then also best bets. Next up, favorite underdog. We'll start with Sean Zarillo. Makwani Amerikani, Mr. Finland. I view him as the better grappler in this matchup. He just has the worst gas tank. So after five, seven minutes, it could become a little bit questionable on his side. He's not as good at getting people down after that opening frame. But going against Jonathan Pierce, I certainly view him as the better grappler. And you look at Pierce's last fight, he put his neck in a lot of different positions where Amerikani probably would have snatched it up. He got rocked a couple times on the feet, and Amir Khani has enough power to hurt people. I think this fight should be basically a coin flip at worst. Amir Khani, almost all of the early finishing upside, and then maybe Pierce takes over down the stretch or finds a late finish of his own. But from a pre-fight perspective, this is a very clear Amir Khani bet to me. 
he gets the dominant positions in all of his fights. He gets a takedown basically every time, unless he finishes his opponents first, but you just look through back through his fight history. He gets to dominant positions on basically every single opponent that he faces, even if he ends up getting finished later. Great record Roman wrestler. His front stroke series is tremendous and he's able to lock in chokes on almost everybody, whether they defend it off is a different story, but he's able to get to those positions in almost every fight. So a decision is not out of the realm of possibility for him. That is why I'm playing his money line, but I also really like his inside the distance prop around plus 275 and his submission prop around plus 330. Americani plus 155 on the money line, Pierce minus 180. All right, Billy, how about a, an underdog, your favorite dog for the weekend? Yeah, I really like the fight between Hannah Goldie and Molly McCann. You know, Goldie is a pretty prohibitive underdog. She opened about 310 and has gone all the way up to plus 350. So I'm, I'm glad I didn't bet this one earlier in the week but I was considering it. I just think McCann's odds or lines are just so juiced because of that spinning back elbow knockout she landed in her last fight, which was also here in O2. And that's not something that I don't want to say is a fluke or lucky because like she's practiced that a million times, I'm sure. But that's not something that's repeatable that we're going to do on a, you know, fight in and fight out basis. And it's kind of just a theory thing where if we're seeing a fight, it's the one that's most likely to go to a decision on the card. You can get one side at plus 350. You know, that's the side I want to be on. I've got a little bit of concern over some unfavorable judging for the American fighters against the Brits here. But it, this kind of odds, it's too hard to avoid. You know, both women throw a ton of volume. Both should land a lot of strikes. I don't see McCann really getting Goldie to the mat very easily. She's Goldie, that is, is a much stronger physically fighter. McCann might get one or two in there. I don't think that's going to be a major storyline, though. So we've got a bunch of women or a bunch of strikes coming between the women. Probably not a ton of knockdowns, probably not a ton of power unless McCann, er, McCann lands something crazy. I just want to be holding the ticket at that odds if we do see a decision. Moving on to our fight of the night. Chris Curtis is your slight favorite at minus 115, taking on Jack Hermanson, who is at uh, minus 105. By the way, you can catch all these fights on ESPN Plus uh, tomorrow, Saturday, for recording on a Friday. Um, middleweight fight. Sean Zarello, how do you uh, look at this one? Who has the edge and how do you want to bet it? Yeah, I feel bad going against the action man here because one, we are the action network, but two, mm. I bet on Chris Curtis in all of his UFC fights and he has not let me down. I think this is the spot to finally go against him though. He is going from facing multiple unranked fighters who have bad cardio to facing a top eight middleweight who has very, very good cardio. The striking should actually be close. Now, Curtis is the better boxer in the pocket. I think he could piece Hermanson up. But when they're at range, Jack's kicks are better. And I think he's going to do a good job staying on the outside of the cage, pitter-pattering Curtis with strikes, and then eventually working his way into the clinch, getting some cage push, maybe getting takedowns. Hermanson has all the grappling upside here. Now, you see Curtis's recent fights where he denied 22 takedowns against Adolfo Vieira more takedowns in his other bouts as well. I said, though, going against guys with worse cardio, who gas out rather quickly, who can't sustain that takedown threat throughout the course of the fight. For Manson, absolutely going to be able to sustain the takedown threat for 15 minutes. Keep Curtis on his toes. Curtis actually got pieced up by Vieira on the feet because he was worried about defending the takedowns in the first round. Well, he's going to have to worry about those takedowns against her Manson too. So should open up some striking exchanges for Jack upstairs as well. I think this is a slight lean to Hermanson as a favorite, even though you're getting around plus 100, minus 110. I'd prefer to wait to get plus money on him. I was able to grab some plus 100 myself. But this is a big step up in competition for Chris Curtis. I said going against an actual ranked middleweight instead of guys who have clear flaws and are outside of the ranking. So toughest matchup for him to date. He's been grappled by better grapplers in the past. I don't think he's faced the right matchup yet in the UFC. Billy, are you picking a side or is there another angle? Yeah, if I had to pick a side, I think I would actually lean Curtis. There's just a little bit of uh, similarity between the matchups and the guys they fought before. You know, Sean's right in that it's a step up, but he's fought guys who pretty much wanted to bring him to the ground. That was their only game plan. And he has 100% takedown defense against guys like Phil Hawes and Brendan Allen, who are solid grapplers too. And, you know, we saw Hermanson get 
picked apart a little bit by Sean Strickland. That's a training partner. Chris Curtis is, and Curtis definitely has more power. So I don't think Hermanson's going to survive that many shots from Curtis. With all that said, I don't think that's the best way to play it unless we can get plus money on Curtis. I'm looking at the under two and a half. This one seems pretty binary in that if it goes to the mat and Hermanson can get those takedowns, I think he puts away Curtis on the ground. And if Curtis can deny one or two of those and make Hermanson tire himself out going for him, he should be able to get the knockout. Neither of these guys really tend to last a long time. Six of nine, six of Hermanson's nine wins in the UFC were stoppages, all either ground and pound or submission. So it seems like whichever arena this one stays in, that guy's going to get a finish and under two and a half is even money right now. So, you know, there's a little bit of danger of a late stoppage from either guy, but I'll take the under two and a half at even money. Okay. Our UFC London preview continues. It's at O2 arena in London, England. Favorite props, and as we encourage you when it comes to the prop market, really any market, shop the lines. Sean Zarillo, where are we looking in the prop market for this weekend? Yeah, Amir Khani inside the distance at plus 275, probably my favorite prop, but I already gave that out. So let's do two other ones at plus money. Nikita Krylov at plus 300 by decision against Alexander Gustafson. Gustafson coming back from a long layoff. I don't believe he's won a fight in like five years. He got finished in his last fight against Fabricio Verdum. Verdum, a very dangerous submission artist. Krylov is a bit of a finisher himself, but I could just see him out wrestling Gustafson here for the majority of the fight. Made his decision line about plus 225, so decision for Krylov about plus 300. Also, the fight to go to decision is something I'm considering betting as well. And then in the first fight of the night between Claudio Silva and Nicholas Dalby, Silva basically has one path to winning which is via early submission. You can get a submission line out there at about six to one, even as high as seven to one. I made that line closer to plus 430. So Claudia Silva by submission at plus 600. And then you could look to live at Dalby after round one. Okay, very good. How about you, Billy? Prop market for us. What do you got? Yeah, you know, normally I'm not a huge prop guy, but this one just jumped out to me. This one's easy. I've got Paul Craig by submission at plus 250. You know, he opened at plus 150 on the money line, and that's dropped all the way down a little bit. So I think the better value is just here by submission. All Paul Craig does is submit people. He's not really going to even try to strike with you. If you start hitting him, he'll just pull guard and pull you on top of him. He doesn't even need a takedown. Even when he was beating up Shogun Hua on the ground, wasn't a TKO, Shogun tapped to strikes. That goes down as a submission too. So if you think Paul Craig has any chance of winning this one, I don't see a reason to play it anything other than submission. That's plus 250. As long as uh, Vulcan doesn't hang out in there and get an arm broken and that gets rolled to TKO, we should be good on that one if Paul Craig ends up getting the win. Okay, excellent. And to your point, he's down to plus 130 on the money line. So, yes, that has uh, that has dipped slightly. Okay, next up on the pot, we turn to our DFS guy, Billy, and we're going to look at uh, the DFS contest. Look at the DraftKings contest now big big card billy one of our bigger cards in the last couple of weeks 14 fights which uh makes for a lot of fun but uh in the same breath makes for a lot of uh bigger decisions more difficult decisions right yeah i for one i'm just so glad it's not you know a 12 11 fight card where we're trying to pull out all the stops and do something weird just to not get duplicated you know they've got all the big contests up almost like a pay-per-view or some of the big first place prizes so a lot of people are going to be mmeing you know, you still want to worry about that ownership a little bit, but it's not, you know, priority number one, like on an 11 fight card. But what's interesting here is more than half the fights, there's someone favored by minus 230 or more. So it kind of sets up, in my opinion, a straightforward DFS strategy where we need to nail one or two underdogs, get the main event right, and then just not have one of those heavy favorites that gets upset. So it's obviously easier said than done, but I think that's pretty much going to be what we need to do you just want people a bunch of money i mean that's good that was good analysis (laughs) right yeah if you can (laughs) correctly identify all of those things congratulations you're rich (laughs) but uh yeah you know on the cheaper side i like hannah goldie for cash games just she fits all the normal boxes both women in that fight throw a ton of strikes longest odds to get stopped she's averaging over 40 points even in her losses in the ufc so like she's just a perfect floor play for cash games and then in terms of gpps on the cheap side there's a lot of guys who or if they win, it's very likely to be a stoppage. Sean mentioned Malquan Amirakani. He's won Paul Craig, as I've mentioned before. You know, I'm going to touch on this in a minute with my best bet, but I think Jordan Levitt's in the same boat. He's not taking a decision from Patty Pimblett. If he wins, it's probably going to be a stoppage on the ground and probably pretty quick. So if, you know, one of those three or two of those three can get a win, especially if it's a stoppage, and then you avoid those high-priced fighters that tank, that's pretty much all you need to do. Easy game. 
There you go. Sean Zarello, you have any thoughts on the uh, daily fantasy angles here? Yeah, three fights where I see a finish very likely occurring, aside from Makwan Mirkani at 7,500, who I'm definitely going to use. But the main event, either a quick finish for Aspinall or a dominant wrestling outcome or probably a finish for Curtis Blades. One of Paul Craig and Vulcan Ozdemir, I see one of those guys is very likely to finish. And then one of Jai Herbert or Kyle Nelson. So you can mix and max, mix and match one of those or one of those fighters from each of those three fights on top of the Amir Khani. It's 7,500. Play around with those. That's how I'll build the majority of my lineups. Yeah. And depending on how you're doing that with our optimizer, you can also set rules on the fantasy labs. You can set it, and this is something I always want to point out to people, you can set it to have at least one fighter from that fight, or you can set it to have exactly one. So when you're picking fights that you think someone's going to get an early stoppage, that's when we want that exactly one fighter rule in the optimizer. And you could set three or four of those with those fights that end early, and it's going to kind of take care of the rest for you. Is is Blades appropriately priced? Like, Should should it be close? I mean, it's, it's close to Ospinal, but is that appropriately priced? Yeah, I mean, anytime the main event fight, the guys are as close as they are. It's near a lock that whoever wins that is going to be in the optimal. As okay. long as it's not one guy, like, you know, we saw is a few weeks ago who was 9,600 or something. And most people figured out that even if he wins, he's not going to be in the optimal. Right. With these guys, especially heavyweights with the stoppage odds, anything under 8,500 or so for both guys, it's like, they're going to make it in there. So I'm not too concerned with trying to pick which one of those guys is, guys gets in there, but I'm definitely going to have one of each of them and 99% if not all of my lineups. Okay. Good stuff. All right, last thing we need to do before we wrap best bets for UFC London. We'll start with Sean Zarillo. So I know Billy just talked about Paul Craig by submission. If you are playing the Craig side, I think that is the way to play him. Play submission or inside the distance. Do not play his money line because he has a very low chance of winning a decision here against Volcano Ozdemir. I like Ozdemir on the money line at minus 145. I projected him closer to 65% or minus 185, and this is coming from somebody who has bet Paul Craig in the past. Last time Craig fought in London, Billy and I were all over his inside-the-distance props, but they are a little bit suppressed compared to that fight against Nikita Krylov. He closes a plus 180 underdog against Krylov, plus 225 against Jamahal Hill. This is a much more suppressed line at plus 130 for a guy who does not win minutes, is generally losing up until the moment that he wins and pulls something out of his butt. So Volkan taking a step down in competition relative to his previous fights. I think he's the clear minute winner on the feet. Should even be able to finish Craig if this fight stays on the feet for extended stretches. Has good takedown defense in the past, sitting at 80% for his career. The one thing he cannot do, and I'm worried he's going to do this, is hurt Paul Craig standing. Craig goes to his back, and then Volkan follows him on top and gets triangled. So do not follow him to the ground. Make him get back up if you heard him, Volcan. I'm sure you're not listening, but if you are, please do not follow him to the ground. Volcan on the money line, minus 145. I think the number is just a little bit short relative to his finishing upside and his minute winning upside, but I do not disagree with the Craig by submission or Craig inside the distance takes. And for Billy, your best bet of the 14 fights, you're on a money line pick. What do you got? Yeah, I'm worried about this one, or I'm worried it's going to be pretty unpopular, but I'm looking at a noted handicapper, by the way, Jordan Levitt who, you know, we talked about him in his last fight. He came out and gave a probabilistic answer. And that speaks to his fight IQ. But he's fighting Patty Pimblett, as most people listening probably know. And I, I understand why Patty's the favorite. He's looked good. But, man, there's so many holes in his game. He runs in with his hands down and his chin up. He's wild on the ground. He's leaving all kinds of stuff out there. Somebody is going to take advantage of that as a significant underdog against Patty Pimblett. And it just might be Jordan Levitt. I'm not convinced that it will be, but he has tons of grappling upside. You know, we saw him make his USA debut with a vicious slam. It's something I'd truly never seen before. We posted on a guy's head before slamming him. He finds submissions. He finds a way to win. I just think there's enough cracks in what Pimblet brings to the table that someone's going to find a way to exploit it. I think Levitt's a pretty sharp guy. I think he's going to be looking at those things. So when you can get him all the way up at plus 225, I got to take that. 